Genesis chapter 2. Parson to person reads, in Genesis 2 we see God establishing the basic relationship between a man and a woman in marriage. He said, therefore a man shall leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. That's in verse 24. That is God's foundation for the establishing of a marriage. Two become one. The deepest and most intimate bond is the two becoming one in marriage. This is the foundation for godly relationships. That's the way God planned it. That's the way God wants it to be. Amen. We used to sing that back in the 70s. <laughs> Billy... can't remember Billy's last name. That's the way God planned it, if you want to hear it. <laughs> Sunday? Yeah, Billy Sunday. Billy Joe? <laughs> Billy Graham? <laughs> no. Billy... Keyboard man. No, Keyboard man for the Beatles and for Preston. all of those famous groups back in the 70s. Preston. Preston. Billy Preston. There you go. Uh, I was so close. Where were you? <laughs> 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 yeah. Scripture reading this week is Matthew chapter 19. Jesus uh, goes on to explain a little further about marriage. And a man is a complete failure at it. Amen. I don't have to tell you guys that. Uh, anybody here come, to, come from a perfect family? <laughs> uh, we have our Calvary Chapel uh, studies on Facebook. And on YouTube, you can go to Calvary Chapel or Calvary of Santa Rosa dot com, and then uh, have the links there for these uh, studies online. <clears throat> this morning is 10, 10 o'clock. Sunday morning at ten o'clock. Uh, Sunday evening is six o'clock. Uh, Mike's going to be starting the Book of Esther tonight at six. We already started it. Oh, you started it last <laughs> week. Yes. <laughs> Jumping the gun. <laughs> we we'll gotta keep up with the. With we'll the be starting paperwork. acts. Yeah, we'll be starting acts at the minutes. Oh, no. oh. Tuesday morning and Thursday morning at eight thirty, we have the inductive Bible study. Uh, we're going through First Corinthians uh, at, from eight thirty to eight eight thirty to about ten ten thirty. Um, Wednesday, the Bible study with uh, Laverne this week. In the, bot, in the book of Mark. Uh, That's canceled. It's canceled? She's, a, she's yeah, gone. She's, she's out of town. She's coming gone. back Tuesday. Yeah. She'll be back Tuesday? Yeah. Uh, what you can do is uh, call Mike. <laughs> <laughs> and that number is... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh God, we don't have Mike's email in here. <laughs> I have to put his email on there. First Saturday of the month, we have the women's prayer breakfast. Third Saturday of the month, we have the men's prayer breakfast. Uh, did I say Thursday? No, Thursday at 6.30, the men's study is going to begin the book of Acts with Mike. Sabbath days were just the shadow of things to come. They are the substance. The substance creates the shadow, and the substance is Jesus. The shadow that Jesus cast on the Old Testament was the Sabbath day, the day of rest. Come unto me, all ye that labor, Amen. and I will give you more work to do. No, I will give you rest, praise God. Where was I? The shadow that Jesus cast on the Old Testament was the Sabbath day, the day of rest. So Jesus has become our Sabbath as Christians. Do you keep the Sabbath? Every day. Amen. Every day. Thank you, Lord, for your uh, word. Thank you. Pray that you would uh, just pour out your spirit this morning to bless each person just in a special way, Father God as we look at your word, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right.
hoping that scripture has some kind of a, uh, you know, where you won't even know, but you were looking at it while he was talking about meetings during the week, and somehow that scripture might sink in. Behold, how pleasant it is, right? For us to dwell together in unity. Um, not just Sunday, but all the time, whenever we can. And actually, Genesis chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 3, really kind of go along with chapter 1. And we did read through uh, verses 1 and 3 um, last week. Uh, but it's worth reading again and touching on the seventh and final day. Uh, so Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended His work, which He had made, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work, which He had made. And God blessed the seventh day, and He sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Um, three things that God does on the seventh day. What's interesting is the seventh and final day is the only day that doesn't have an evening and in the morning. <laughs> the evening and the morning. Remember last, uh, last week as we talked about day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, and day six, all have an evening and a morning that make up the, uh, the days. To this day, um, in Israel, that's how they calculate the day. Their day starts at sunset. And I like that because then it goes from darkness to light. And it's a, there's a spiritual picture there. If, see, our days end in darkness and begin in light. Um, they, they kind of have it the other way where um, it, it goes from darkness to light. And so, um, and actually right now when we wake up, it's still dark, isn't it? <laughs> For some of us. Um, and just that, that uh, evening and morning um, being that. But the seventh day was to be different. That's what consecrated means. That's what uh, that whole uh, idea. So the first thing that I started off by saying God did three things on the seventh day. The first thing is where we get the very word uh, Shabbat or uh, Sabbath. And it's that word in verse 2 that it says He rested. That word for rested is just that, Shabbat or Sabbath. And it means what it says and says what it means. Um, to put an end to the work. To stop what you're doing so that things might cease. Now, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Um, in other words, the Sabbath is not something that we have to worry about. Um, Paul puts it very clearly in uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 16, that one man might esteem this day to be important and another that day. Um, but for us, for the believer, Christ is the substance. Um, all The Sabbath was a shadow of the substance or the object. Christ is our Sabbath, just as the parson to person in your bulletin pointed out. He is our rest. Ephesians 2.14 makes it clear. Um, he is our peace, um, who has broken down those walls of separation. He is our very, the, the very reason we can rest. It was never intended... We were never intended to uh, keep up on uh, every bit of the law. In fact, um, the Sabbath, because man began to put his hands on it, 
uh, the Sabbath got blown out of proportion to where uh, there's something like uh, 613 different rules and regulations on what you cannot do on the Sabbath to the point where you can't wear a wig on the Sabbath day because it's, it's bearing some kind of weight. If you had false teeth, you couldn't have them in on the Sabbath day. Um, all kinds of weird uh, ideas that, that obviously come from man. There are obviously laws and traditions and rules and regulations that were written by man. But what's interesting is long before Exodus 20, verse 8, that's where you'll read, uh, to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Um, long before that, God was teaching the, the, uh, His children, teaching us, mankind, the importance of taking a day off. Of not just go, 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 go. Did God need to take a day off? No. <laughs> but He rested as an example, really. And really the word, if you do a deep study on that, He rested, it means it's more the idea of the universe stopping and ceasing. There's no more that needs to be made that has been made. In fact, nothing can be bara. Remember we looked last week at that word for created. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God bara. He's the only one who could do that. Who can create out of nothing. We, uh, asa, is, is another word that's brought up in Genesis 1.26 where let us make man. That's that word asa. And I reminded you how you can remember, assemble. We assemble things. We don't necessarily create. None of us can create. Only God can make out of nothing. And did God make so much that now He's just exhausted and needs to rest? No, far from it. In fact, that whole uh, Einstein's theory, E equals MC squared, is the E is energy and matter. What happens with energy and matter? This is all comes from the Bible, really. Every bit of physics and science is in here. Energy and matter, you cannot have more of it than there is in existence. Um, and in fact, it's all uh, winding down. Eventually the universe will have an end. The universe, they, 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 scientists have tried for the longest time to say the universe had uh, no beginning, but science continues to tell the seeker, to tell the one looking into it, that the universe had a, be a beginning. It's clear it, to, to any scientist. Energy had a starting point. And, it, and with that said, it will definitely have an end. With every beginning, there will be an end. And that, that kind of comes up with the seventh. And so the first thing God does on the seventh day is rest. Um, the very number, seven, speaks of completion, finality. Seven, despite what you might think already in your head, seven is not God's number. In fact, in the book of Revelation, guess who has seven heads? The devil, the dragon, the enemy. So seven is not godly by any means. It's not, it's not God's number. However, six, who was created on the sixth? Man and woman. We, we noted that last week. Human. So six is the number of mankind, the number of humans. Six. And the beast, whose number is 666, back in, in Revelation, will be a human. That's one reason we know that. He's, he's far from a deity. He demands to be worshipped as deity, but he's a human. So numerology, five, just for, as a sidebar, five is, is the number of grace. Um, 
And eight is the number for Jesus. I like that. Eight is the number of new beginnings. Eight can be seen as the number of starting over. And this is, you have example after example throughout the Bible. Biblical numerology uh, is incredible when you go through and look. Everything that's written in this book is for a purpose. It's for, it has a very specific design. Um, I mentioned yesterday, at uh, remembering Shirley at, at the memorial there, that the, the human eyeball, <laughs> you cannot look at it in a microscope without saying there is an intelligent designer behind all of this. In a microscope, you look in. In a telescope, guess what happens? Same thing. You cannot deny <laughs> that there is an intelligent designer. And we, we mentioned he has named every star that's in the skies. And it just it blows your mind. So the reason he rested, another interesting thing, is when the manna came down, we'll, we'll get there in a few years, but in the book of Exodus, um, in Exodus 16, the manna came down, and they were able to pick it up, and on the sixth day there was double portion. They had more than enough on the sixth day. And on the seventh, that meant they didn't pick up any. What's interesting about that is Exodus 16 is before Exodus 20. What happens in Exodus 20? The Ten Commandments. The law. Keep the Sabbath day holy. God was already instituting this. And this is just one thing of many of the laws. Uh, we're going to talk about, Lord willing, if we're still here, when we get to Gen Genesis 4, how the sacrificial system would have <coughs> been already in play. Um, so this is just one of many things that God was already teaching, and this is kind of the beginning of it here with the Sabbath day, with resting. <coughs> Why is it that we meet on a Sunday morning? Anybody, uh, someone might ask. Why is it that we gather together on the first day of the week and not the seventh, the Sabbath? The very word Sabbath also can mean seventh. Um, the very simple and quick answer, you say praise God, there's a simple and quick answer. <laughs> Is that we see the very earliest Christians gathering together in the book of Acts, on the first day of the week. Why? Because it was on the first day of the week, John chapter 20, John chapter 21, no, John chapter 20, I believe it is, that Mary and the women came to the tomb. The first evangelist in the world, the very first evangelists were women. Sorry, guys. The very first evangelists to affect the world around them with the gospel message that Jesus is alive, was women. That's for a reason, too. Um, and when did that happen? It was on the first day of the week. We gather together on Resurrection Sunday. Every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. The reason it's a Sunday is because that's the day that Jesus rose from the grave. And He's the first fruit, the first one to do that. We're to follow <laughs> very soon. Some of you sooner than others. <laughs> however, there, however, there is a mystery, isn't there? I, hold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all die. Right? Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. So there, everyone in this room may not die. We all say, Praise God! Let's go. Well, maybe. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. That'd be the best, right? So, the seven, uh, the eighth being a type there of uh, the first day of the week, starting over. We know there's not eight days in a week, Mike. No matter how hard you want to make that go, but um, it's it's very interesting when you look at biblical numerology. Um, set apart. Uh, the Sabbath was set apart for 
to, to, for an example for you and, I, you and I. I would argue that the reason we have so many heart attacks, so many um, illnesses, is because people do not understand the importance to your physical health that it is to take a day off. We go, 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 go. We can't afford to take a day off. I can't afford two hours on a Sunday morning. Maybe this morning it'll be three. So give me you know, good time. We can't afford. We can't afford this or that. Why? Because because we just got to go. We got to make things happen. We got to do it. We got to do it. God, who is all powerful, all knowing. There's nothing that surprises him. God took a day off. How dare you think? No, I got this. I need to do it. I know God got a little tired, but I've got this. No, are you kidding me? Talk about a slap in the face. Now, um, it's important that we don't get legalistic about it, but we see how <coughs> somebody said that the Bible is the manual, the owner's manual for the human body. <laughs> and it's very, it's very, uh, very true. These are, these are B-I-B-L-E, the basic instructions before leaving earth. This is it that we're looking at. And so it's good for us to take a day off. God blessed. That's the second thing God does on the seventh day. Um, verse 3, right? God blessed the seventh day. And I, I think it's worth noting, God blesses us. His creation. He blesses it. Even the day that, that this final day would make up. And it's just encouraging to see that God blesses us with every spiritual blessing. Hebrews 10.10 um, is another good one. Uh, speaking of sanctification. Because that's the third thing, the final thing that God does is sanctify it. Um, which, by the way, we need God to sanctify us. You cannot sanctify yourself. You need God to sanctify you. Uh, by the which we will we um, by the which we will God's will that we this is Hebrews 10:10. 10, 10, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. You don't sanctify yourself, you don't bless yourself. So these other two things that God does on the seventh day blesses it and sanctifies it is are things that you don't do yourself. God does that. God blesses it. We pray God bless this burger to my heart. Bless this bacon and somehow make it holy. Do we have the ability to bless that food? Yes. God, God blesses things. Now, a good example of this, I didn't want to go into it, but might as well, I've already made it this far. When God sanctifies something, when God blesses something, it's on His terms. And a great example of this is what's going on with marriage, what has been going on in the study today is supposed to be about marriage, much of it, but I'll get there. <laughs> I think, Lord willing. But can you bless this marriage, pastor? And some humans, pastors in their pointy little heads, their twisted minds, will bless this marriage that is unequally yoked, or same sex, or heaven forbid you want to marry your dog. Yeah, I'll bless that. I'll sanctify that. And it's so sad. No, when God sanctifies it, when God blesses it, you, it's on His terms. And you know when it's Him that blesses it, sanctifies it. And when it's some man with a degree or a num number a letter, some kind of an important number or letter after his name, um, 
you know the difference, how important it is that it's Him that blesses the work. It's Him that sanctifies it. Try to do it on your own. You can't. There's, it's not going to work. So, then we have the law of first mention. Verse 4 is a very powerful one. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that, here it is, the first time we ever see this word, this phrase, the Lord God. Up to this point, it's just been God. But in verse 4, we have the law of first mention. And in fact, rabbis call it the unpronounceable word or name of God. The Lord. For God, it's Elohim, or El, or Ella. We looked at that in Genesis 1.1. But for the Lord, it's this J-H-V-H. Try to pronounce that. You can't. Or Y-H-V-H. The closest we've come is Yahweh. Or if you put an E and an O and an A as your vowels between the J-H-V-H uh, you come up with Jehovah. This is the Lord. This is now man has been created. Man has been brought onto the scene. And we see the first time, the Lord. <laughs> is He your Lord? Because it's so important. So, the Lord God made the earth and the heavens and every plant of the field, verse 5, before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth and there was no man to till the ground, but there went up this mist from the earth and it watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So, uh, this kind of takes us back to that firmament. I meant to talk about that last week. I don't know why I didn't. It would have only taken another hour or so to talk about it. But... The waters that were below the earth had been separated from the waters. Well, God separated the waters from the waters on the earth to the waters above the earth. This firmament or expanse is like a water canopy that would have covered the earth, made the whole earth like a big greenhouse. Um, very tropical. You would have had, you know, I hear... Some say you would have had grapes the size of watermelons. You would have had just craziness. And they they found uh, dragonflies with like a three-foot wingspan. <laughs> Talk about your windshield's nightmare. <laughs> but <laughs> the blanket that covered the earth, this blanket of water, explains these incredible findings that, that they've, they've been baffled by and um, evolution tries to explain in, in professing themselves to be wise they become fools um, but it explains not just that but it also explains why man lived to be about 969 years old we'll, we'll see in Genesis 5 uh, the name of that man the oldest man that ever lived 969 years old uh, because the UV rays would be filtered, in a way, through that water. Everything must have grown so lush and so incredible. So this mist that came up from the ground, God just kind of puts in His own built-in irrigation system there. Um, and He's the one that, that came up with it. So don't be surprised when you see those neat little sprinkler systems. God is the originator. The one who originally came up with it. And then we have the encouragement of verse 7 that uh, no matter how good you might make yourself look, um, you're nothing but dust. I'm nothing but dust. In fact, uh, in Psalm 103, verse 14, God says, I remember your frame 
And I know that you are but dust. Psalm 103, 14. Uh, he knoweth our frame and he remembers that we are but dust. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 20. Another encouraging verse for uh, your positive and uplifting messages. You won't, you won't hear this one on Caleb much. Ecclesi <laughs> positive and encouraging Caleb. All go to one place. All are of dust or came from dust and all will return to dust again. Yippee! <laughs> but that's the very uh, truth of it all. And somebody said, you never see a masterpiece with, with people focusing on the frame. You never want the frame of this incredible painting to take away from the masterpiece, the artwork. You don't want the frame to end up looking better than the, what the painting is. And in the same way, God, we're created in the image of God, but we're just dust. We're just the frame, if you will. God knows that. No matter how you paint your pot up, you're nothing but a clay pot. When we get to the New Testament, it becomes clearer. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole lot in that. People spend all kinds of money and time painting up their pot. Um, it really doesn't do a whole lot of good. The dust, you came from dust, and you're going to return to dust. There's, there's nothing special about it. Uh, sorry if you came in here feeling pretty good about yourself. <laughs> It's the Lord's will. We, know, we need to know this, though. Why? Because it's our tendency, I know I'm not the only one, that begin to think, yeah, of course God chose me. He's got good taste. You know. Yeah, I mean, come on. I can see why He didn't choose that person down there. <laughs> and we, we, get, we start to feel pretty good about ourselves, we start to get uh, prideful. Can you believe it? It's important for us to remember Genesis 2, verse 7. <coughs> but we didn't have life. There was no life until the breath of God. He breathed into our nostrils the breath of of life, He breathed into us the Spirit, really. It's the same word that's used for breath, for wind, is Spirit. And, and we see the Spirit, the fingerprints all over Genesis. We saw uh, back in Genesis 1, verse uh, 2, that it was the Spirit of God that moved upon the face of the deep, the face of the waters. Here in chapter 2, it's the Spirit of God that's being referred to there in verse 7 that gives us life, makes us a living soul. He did not do that to the elephants. He did not do that to the gorillas. He did not do that to the dogs and to the cats and to the, the pets. You are a living soul. You have become this living soul. And we mentioned that too in verse 26 too. It's, it's good to go back to that and see that you were created body, mind, and spirit. Don't get distracted with animals. I think that we can look and see the Babylon, the Babylonian uh, gods, the false gods, and I, I think I mentioned Dagon, the, the first merman, you know, the fish god, half man, half fish. How silly to think of those things. But God, uh, uh, rather, the enemy, Satan, has used a animals for a long, 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 long time to just pull us away. And just as people begin to hug trees, People begin to focus their attention on what? The creation. 
rather than the Creator. Guess what? Trees have life in them, just like animals do. There's, there's no difference there. And you can see how you, you can end up with some really silly and uh, perverted doctrines when you start to get your eyes off of the Creator. So the Lord God takes man. Verse 8 goes on. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there He put the man whom He had formed. And out of the ground He made, uh, made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant in the sight, or pleasant to the sight, and good for food, the tree of life, also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it, went, it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first river is Pison. This, that is, it was compassed uh, the whole land of Havila, Havila uh, where there is gold, and the gold that, of that land is good. There's this delium and on, the onyx stone, and the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is that that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia, or Cush. And the name of the third river is Hidel, Hidekel, or your margin you'll notice it says the Tigris. That is it, it which goes toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to tend or to dress it and to keep it. Again, there is a reason God put these details in here, but what's interesting is this is all before Genesis chapter 6. Um, we forget that, and there's many scholars and many people get so sidetracked and people that are hungry to find this gold that's spoken of is so good the gold that's there that's there in, in uh, near the uh, the this second river um, the first two that are that are mentioned rather um, we don't know the the area and just because it says um, Ethiopia, or the whole land of Cush, where this Tigris and Euphrates area is, Mesopotamia, kind of that whole region. Hey, this is before the whole cataclysmic shifting of everything. Genesis chapter 6, what is it? The flood. Remember the four, the way that our uh, study in Genesis divides up. You have four major events. The, remember what they are? We're still in the first one. The creation, uh, the fall, the flood, and the dispersion. Four major events. That's Genesis 1 through 11. And then 11 through 50 is four major people. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. So, very simple to divide the book of Genesis up uh, for study. Um, and I think important to, to review that from time to time. So, this is before the third, or the second major event that we're going to look at, the flood. No, that is the third major event. <laughs> Creation, fall, and the flood. So the third major event, that is going to change everything, <laughs> uh, including wiping out some species, <laughs> including wiping out all of mankind other than eight, eight people. Interesting. What was the number of new beginnings? Eight. God's going to start over anew. Um, and there's there's a lot in there. Uh, and so you, you could try and track these down. People have tried for centuries. We know who the original humans were. We know what race they were. Because, see, we could find this here. Interesting. God did not want that to happen. And the flood... <laughs> It, it keeps that from happening. Keeps what from happening? Partiality. Some kind of uh, greater race. 
than anyone else. It, it's, it's fascinating. Again, everything that God does is for a reason, and it's very intricate. It's designed so well. Um, Eden, by the way, means, the very word Eden uh, means pleasant, or we might even say paradise, pleasure, paradise. This is what God wanted for man, for mankind. And this is what God, God wanted. Uh, and people get upset at verse 16, 17 rather. People get upset at this, and this is, this is where we, it gets real interesting. And verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the tree uh, of the garden that thou mayest freely eat. Now, I'll stop there because I have that underlined, highlighted, because nobody seems to focus on that part of the story. That God looked at man and said, Every tree here you can eat up freely. I love you, son. Every tree here is good for food. It's good for you. That'd be a good spot to stop. <laughs> but everyone quickly goes to, and in the story, everyone knows the part in verse 17 that many have a problem with. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, now, that tree thou shalt not eat of. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, I'm going to kill you. That's not what it says, is it? No. Another very important note. Another very important thing to understand in this story is just like a father looking at your son and telling him, you better not go and eat that rat poison over there or I'm going to take out a gun and shoot you, son. No, it's you better not go over to that rat poison and start picking it up and eating it. It will kill you. In the day that thou eatest thereof, that very thing is going to kill you, son. Josh, you just can't play catch on the freeway. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll beat you up over your head. My son, Josh, five years old, right? No. Josh, in the day that you go out on the freeway and play catch, you're going to die in the day that you do that. It's going to kill you. This is God's heart. This is the love uh, of a father looking out for his children. And the Lord God said... <laughs> Thou shalt surely die the day that you eat it. Verse 18 goes on. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man... Um, the only thing in his creation <laughs> where we see God say, Look at him. It's not good, the man. Look at him. He's got a big nose. His ears are kind of crooked. It's not good. This man. That she, he should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. Uh, comparable to him or equal to him. I will make him a helpmate. I will make him someone who will compliment him. In other words, I will give him... Uh, I'll make him look good. Somebody that, that will be good for him. Verse 19, Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, and he brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. God wants to learn what Adam's going to do. And whatsoever Adam called every creature, every living creature, that was the name thereof. Even the platypus. Yeah. Came up with that. Adam gave names to the cattle, to the fowl of the air, the birds of the air, and to the every beast of the field. And for Adam, there was no found and help meet for him or uh, someone that 
that he could love. He could look and see Mr. and Mrs. Giraffe, Mr. and Mrs. Orangutan, Mr. and Mrs. this or that, but there was no, no one for him. Verse 21, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, the word for ribs there can actually be better interpreted side. From his very side, he took out, and it very well was one of his ribs, and he closed up the flesh instead thereof, verse 22, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is bone, now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall become one, one flesh. And they were both naked and the man and his wife were not ashamed. You might jot uh, Mark 10, verse 6 through 9, next to verse 24 there. That's where Jesus gives a little more. It goes back, reaches back to this story to straighten out uh, this whole thing that the Pharisees try to trap him with. But as I had mentioned, Verse 17 causes so many to kind of get upset. So many kind of get confused. Well, he's God. He knew what would happen. Why put a tree there at all? And what's interesting is the very nature of the tree being there is, is <laughs> the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that very thing existing in, in the garden would make evil. Because everything was good, and now you have the choice. Is this good, or will you choose evil? <laughs> good and evil. The knowledge of good and evil. Who knows what's good? Who knows what's evil? Only God. Only God. And as soon as we take it into our own hands, the reason for the tree is, is, to, is because God did not want a relationship, and you cannot have a relationship without what? Choice. I would be very worried. Um, I would be very... Curious, I should say. Very, uh, it would bother me if there were no other men on the planet and my wife married me. <laughs> I would start to think, does she love me or is this just because I'm her only choice? Now, if there was one other guy and then she chose me, I'd say, oh, right on. Now I know. <laughs> That's the same kind of thing here. God wanted to give you a choice. To be with Him or to not be with Him. To, to be in good, paradise, pleasurable, with everything you could ever imagine. Or start to find out and see what man thinks is good and what man thinks is bad. And how far, how far we've fallen in this time that we're in. God demonstrates His great love for Adam by bringing and giving this choice. Joshua 24, verse 15. I wrote that next to verse 17 because that's where Joshua says in Joshua 24, 15. Choose this day whom you will serve. I thought we were just robots in your army, Joshua. No, because Joshua was a godly leader. He will say, choose now 
who you will serve. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. God is that, that same way. Uh, forced love is rape. God is not like that. If you start to look around and read and get into theology, and there are books out there that ultimately make God out to be a rapist, for lack of better words. Forced love is rape. That needs to be said. It's hard to say it. In a time, in a culture where people are too sensitive for that kind of thing. God loves with an unconditional kind of love where it's, it's the furthest thing from that. He, in fact, makes it even easier to choose Him. This is all so good for you. I've blessed it. I've sanctified it. I've made it so wonderful. And, and it's... it's uh, it's exciting. Um, and it gets us set up. It really does get us set up for chapter 3. And chapter 3 is one of the most, arguably the most important chapter in the Bible. <laughs> we have the very first uh, prophecy that we're going to look at, um, Lord willing, in a, f a few minutes here. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Next week, Lord willing, at, at chapter 3. But I do want to touch on this because, um, and I meant to, to mention back in uh, verse 2, it's going way back to the, the, the Sabbath day and that God rested. Uh, there was two things that causes controversy even still. And that's the question, uh, Pastor Mike, Pastor Gary, do you what do you think of um, birth control? Uh, what do you think of this whole idea of you know should we kind of go that route? Is it okay for young married couples to to uh, kind of this whole idea of birth control? Well, one place you could take them as a pastor, and I will, is uh, God rested. He created. He made many things, and there was a time where he said, that's enough. I've got three kids. I've got five kids. I've got nine kids. I think I'm, I'm resting now. I'm done. That's an important little point, I think. God does that for an example for you and I. Uh, the other thing, and we'll... I, I, I promise that I'm bringing things to a close. We've only got about an hour and a half left. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. This whole idea of the, the woman being brought out of man's side. Um, and somebody said it's a, that she was not made from the head of Adam, that she would be the head of him or lord it over him. She was not brought out of the foot of Adam that Adam would trample on her, but rather from the side so that it speaks of this equality, this equal. Uh, and in that very word in your New King James, uh, in verse 18, I will make him someone comparable, your New King James renders it. That's a very, very good way to put it. Somebody who is equal, comparable to Adam. But not taken out of the head that she would be in charge. Not that it's from his foot that he would be in charge, but from his side that he could have his arm around her to protect her and from his side being closest to his heart. It's kind of, kind of cute, right? Yeah. But... but and, and it's, it's very natural uh, for a man to put his arm around the woman. And uh, we see this companionship. We see this uh, 
equalness that comes up. And what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Um, the first surgery that takes place, right? Note very carefully in verse 21 that it wasn't until Adam was in a deep sleep. There's a lot of guys, a lot of girls running around and trying to make it happen. I've got to meet Mr. Wright. I've got to meet this guy or that guy. i got to go here and there. And they do. They go and go. Hey, once you go into a deep sleep, <laughs> she's going to come along without you even knowing it. It's how it happened for me. It, was, it wasn't until I gave up and just, all right, I surrender. I'm in a deep sleep. And that speaks of even after when you're married. Remember, Christian, do you ever read in the Bible, in the New Testament, of a Christian dying? That he's dead? No. It never uses that term referring to believers, to a Christian. It says that he sleeps. So, men, have you died? Are you dead? Because once you get to that point of being dead to yourself, that's when God's going to start to make... And, and I, I have to mention, because it was fascinating, uh, something new that God had revealed to me, is out of Christ's side on the cross, there came out blood and water, which is a sign of something being birthed, something being born. You're born of the water. You're born of the blood. And a bride was brought out of the side of Jesus Christ on the cross. Who is the bride? You, me. How do we come in to be the bride? It's the cross. It's Calvary. And that, that very same idea from, from Adam's side, the first Adam, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, Paul refers to this first Adam, and that Christ, Jesus Christ, is the last Adam. I, I warned you, we'd be talking about Jesus every study. In Genesis, even though it's the law, it ends up being this study. Um, and, it, and it shows us how uh, Christ is, is uh, our second Adam, our hope, and our, our uh, husband for the bride of Christ. Another interesting thing here is that um, uh, in verse 24, um, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother? Wait, did Adam have a father? Did Eve have a mother? No, there's no fathers and mothers at this point. Aha! See, you guys all get together and believe that crazy book. Found the problem right here. <laughs> father and mother. There's no fathers and mothers yet. Who wrote the book of Genesis? Moses. We know that. And this is one, one big tell right here is that Moses wrote this. And this verse becomes so important and what, one of the reasons I told you to jot down Mark 10, 6 through 9 is because in Genesis, this is the verse that Jesus quotes from. Shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave? And that word cleave speaks of this glue this bond, this bonding that is really difficult to get apart. Almost impossible. Almost. That's the second controversial thing. First thing was the birth control thing. I already covered that. <laughs> second controversial and final controversial thing is divorce. Malachi 2 verse 16 the one that you should have highlighted in your Bible. Malachi 2.16, where we read, God hates divorce. And there's three reasons, according to the Scriptures, for divorce. 